Welcome to Fortune Forecast. I am Daisy and you are in my book playlist. We have started on the book titled Prosperity Plus, written by John Seaman Garns and published in 1938 by the School of Psychology and Divine Science. I hope that you've been enjoying this book so far. If you're new to my channel, welcome. I'm glad you found us. And to our Fortune community, welcome back. If you are jumping into this book for the first time, uh, I do have a previous chapter to this, so please do visit my book playlist and grab the whole book in its entirety. If you would like to continue on to the chapter, please do go to my description and click on the timestamp. It'll take you right there. Otherwise, hang out with me. So I um, was looking at the word prosperous, which was what attracted me to the book. And the definition of prosperous, according to the Oxford Dictionary, it's stated as successful in material terms, flourishing financially, bringing wealth and success. So then I took this a little bit further and I was sitting here quietly after reading this last, the last chapter, pondering about the human race and what are the natural rights of humans. I know that many times in the United States, we talk about our inalienable rights. And it's funny because inside the word inalienable, you have the word alien and able and the word in which means not not alien able i mean what does that really mean when you play on words right so then going back to that good old oxford dictionary inalienable means unable to be taken away from or given away by the possessor so let's talk about now one of the things that is talked a lot about our inalienable rights. And so again, doing a little research, according to the University of Montana, our inalienable rights pretty much is that all persons are free by nature. I like that word, right? Free by nature and equal in their inherent and inalienable rights. And among these rights are the enjoyment of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and the acquiring and possessing of property. So why is it that it's such a struggle? Emotionally, mentally, physically, it shouldn't be that way. And I believe if there was anything to say a sin, it is that, that there are not many people enjoying life that it feels like, I don't know, I can't put my hand on it, but mentally or emotionally uh, or spiritually, I can't put my hand on it, but it feels that a majority of people are struggling, struggling. And sometimes I try to like get to the bottom of it. It's like, where is the struggle? Is it mental? Is it emotional? Is there some type of subconscious programming that wants or does keep the human race down when the spirit we could see around us is wired for expansion? We see that in nature. We see that in the movements of clouds. We see that all around the natural side of things. And if we are part of nature, which I believe we are, why are we not in greater amounts following this natural law of expansion and growth. So I hope that as we keep going through this book and others in this channel, we begin to uncover that for each one of us. It's going to be different. I get that. But I, my aim is that you can find that it, what you're pursuing, that you can unlock your full potential and that you can share that with others and that you can benefit times 10 or a hundredfold and enjoy this beautiful thing called life. So having said that, let's welcome the next part 
in the book titled Prosperity Plus, Establishing Prosperity Consciousness, Instructions in the Use of Mental Setting Up Exercises. It is not enough merely to understand how to operate the mind and expect at once to create for one's self and for others any more than it would be enough to read books on the science and art of swimming and then assume that one were able at once to swim. There is a knack of using the mind so that it consistently and inevitably produces. In the first place, most people have lived for years in a sense of limitation which might be called a poverty consciousness and they must develop a deep conviction of abundance as the normal condition under which the individual should work. Not only so, but the technique of creative thinking must be not merely a formula objective to one's self, but must be a skill handed over to the deeper mind so that in nerve centers, in emotional reactions, in judgments, and in attitudes of mind, both toward the self and toward the universe, the individual is keyed to produce. The second part of this little book has as its purpose the giving of brief lessons and training of the mind for this kind of creative activity. A step at a time we must develop. 1. A rich consciousness which assumes prosperity and comfort as its normal right. 2. An awareness of power to produce, which is confidence not only in the power of mind, but more particularly in our own power to operate it. 3. Readiness to create, which is my confidence that I can create plus an eagerness to leap forward to the act of creation, knowing that inherent power to produce lies in the very nature of mind, and that my mind is that mind. 4. Active desire for abundance and perfection. The habit of mind which immediately reacts to lack, to difficulties, and to inharmonious conditions as a challenge to produce abundance, perfection, and harmony. 5. Write your purposes. The habit of writing down my major desires in a booklet carrying it about with me during the day and often reawakening my mind to these major drives of my creative life. 6. Positive use of imagination, skill and alertness in using the imagination positively. Often in the past, imagination has been the handmaid of my fears and my negative emotions. Now I shall train to have consciousness leap immediately to that which is perfect, beautiful, and harmonious, and to picture it definitely, reinforcing the purpose of the conscious mind. 7. Faith Power Greatest of all is the consciousness of faith or confidence in the absolute creativeness. To him who believes all things are possible and belief more than I have before realized is a habit of mind. The mind is susceptible to this training for faith and I must acquire it if I would succeed. 8. I start something. 9. Action in Expectancy Many people dream dreams of genuine worth, but because they fail to start something, these dreams fall to earth impotent 
and of no effect. The mind may be trained to eager and expectant reactions, and this is necessary if we are to create by the law of prosperity. 10. Oneness with mind as universal power. The deep and abiding consciousness that the little I works in a living unity with a reinforcing infinite. On the love level, we should feel constantly in touch with the universal harmony. On the conscious level, the mind should be ever open to the influx of new ideas. A daily lesson in each of these 10 steps is desirable. The attempt throughout a whole day to follow through with the consciousness of some one lesson vividly in the background of all of our activities will soon establish these qualities for us as operative powers in consciousness. This is our legitimate right. And if we wish to be supermen with the ability to do the unusual creative thing, this kind of training is what we must have. Take then the following affirmative statements corresponding to each of these steps, studying one of them each day. Get clearly before you the ideal which you wish to embody in consciousness then carry it out into experimental activity in your business of living. The next day, take the second quality and apply it in the same way to the practical problems of life. In this way, we shall be making living application of this theory, and in place of merely reading a book on how to be prosperous, we shall be making the science of prosperity into an art of creating abundance. Thus is developed a skill which shall give us added power and confidence that we are creative mind and that we can produce abundantly. If you will faithfully practice these exercises, repeating each at least 10 times through in succession, you will find yourself living in a more poised and powerful fashion. Unexpected opportunities will soon be coming to you. Money will be flowing to you with a seeming effortless power of attraction on your part. You will be able to say with Harry Harrison Brown, Dollars want me. I cannot avoid them. This is the legitimate heritage of a man, and you should claim your heritage These same lessons may be applied in the field of personal relations. The same law of mind will bring you harmony in family, social and love relations, and in all ways make you more attractive, more dynamic, and more capable of operating the principle of leadership with your fellows. If health is your ideal, this same technique will operate to rebuild your body change and stimulate its functional activities, give you an inner health consciousness which reacts to every challenge of the outer world and fills you with an exuberant and wholesome kind of life abundant. When these particular studies or lessons fail to stimulate you mentally, take the principle behind each of them and write a meditation or affirmation for yourself. In this way, you will continue to grow into the consciousness of the dynamic Superman. Next section. Training the mind to higher efficiency. 1. A rich consciousness. I begin to see that there is a law of belief or expectancy which is very powerful. Because I have half feared poverty, I have created a subjective belief in it. Perhaps this has kept me poor. At any rate, this attitude has kept me from really believing and expecting competency and prosperity. And because I have not expected, 
I have not dared to create it. Perhaps attitudes attract situations. Perhaps if I expect new and finer opportunities, I shall attract them. I shall take this attitude and experiment with the truth of this law of mind. Henceforth, I am cultivating a rich consciousness. I am inviting the alert expectancy of new opportunities, of open doors to generous service to others, returning wealth to me. I believe that man can make of himself a creative channel for values enriching everybody. I saturate my mind with this sense of abundance. I have the power within me to make everyone who touches me richer and happier for the contact. 2. Awareness of Power The little self is often too much aware of its weakness. I need to cultivate the consciousness of power. Power consciousness is not synonymous with egotism. It grows out of the knowledge of the laws of power and that they inhere in the very nature of man. I know there is a law of creative mind and that when man uses it, all the surging energies of the universe are behind his thought. I know that when ideas of any desired objective are vividly imagined and completely accepted, that power surges through me to make my desire actual. I lift my mind to a consciousness of its unity with creative mind, knowing that there is only one source of power in the universe. My creative thought is backed by universal power. 3. Readiness to Create I have only rarely thought of my mind as a truly creative power. I know it perceives, remembers, thinks, and imagines but that it should create by thought. How thrilling it is to experiment with the idea that mind really controls events and actualizes new enterprises. So long as I use my mind as though it were limited by my own personality, I know it does not create authoritatively. Often it fails. Too much limitation goes with remembered experiences of the me and its past failures. It is only when I realize that my mind is a part of the one creative power of the universe that I am reinforced. Also, that the subconscious levels of my mind join the universal subconscious and that whatever I believe emotionally is accepted not only in my own little cupful of subconscious mind, but has all the reinforcement from the universal mind behind it. Thus, I become truly aware of the mind's creativeness. When I thus recognize my mind as mind and daringly think my enterprises with the consciousness of cosmic reinforcement, I become truly creative. I am now desiring, imagining, and believing that this deep desire naming my major goal has been sent out into universal mind and is even now on active matrix in universal creative substance. I thus initiate patterns which mind unfailingly manifests. 4. Active desire for abundance and perfection. In the past, I have recognized difficulties, poverty, and obstacles as inevitable and more or less permanent limitations in every man's life. 
Henceforth, I shall recognize obstacles as invitations to me to triumph. I am forming the habit of mind which makes me react immediately to every negative thought or situation with a deep desire for perfection. I no longer passively accept defeat, nor do I quintessentially attend to the negative. I now make a list of all those difficulties which beset my path and opposite each one I write a clearly stated positive ideal of what the condition should be. I shall daily practice this process of turning the negative into the positive. I thus give myself time daily to desire the perfect, the abundant, the true, and the beautiful. I know that whatever mind desires and imagines is already well on the way to fruition. I draw up from the deep wells of the deep self positive ideals by the power of desire and allow mind to give them definite form. 5. Write your purposes. In the past, I have allowed too many of my desires to move over consciousness like birds over a still pool. They have come and gone, and I have been none the better. I know this is merely wish thinking. I know that to draw up from the deep well of inner consciousness the definite form of my desire and imprison it in words is not only a fine exercise for the mind, but sets me well on the way to creativeness. I am each morning writing in definite propositional statements my major purposes for the day. When these purposes involve plans, I am writing out the plans as clearly as possible. Thus, I make articulate what has been before dim fantasy. I am carrying this project book with me and two or three times during the day, I am reading its worded images of my high purpose. I do not follow these plans slavishly, but when new inspirations come, I write out the statement again in fuller style, adding the inspiration of the moment. Thus, I give mind a chance to translate its dim desires into articulate and definite forms in words. Once or twice a day, I sit with closed eyes and imagine how my new enterprises will seem when finished. These images I allow to come and go, but I steadily hold them to the central drive. Six, positive use of imagination. How often in the past my imagination has been the servant of my fears and of my negative emotions. Constantly across my mind would flash the thought of failure and the picture of myself actually suffering defeat. I know the influence of such thoughts was vicious in the extreme. Now I am training imagination to think only success and the perfect outcome of my projects. In order to take this training, I follow out the thought of yesterday's meditation and take time to allow mind to play about my central desires, knowing that my imagination is not mere fancy, but is the creative faculty of man overleaping the present and truly prophesying and creating the future. Throughout my day, Whenever ugly circumstances or negative situations appear, I immediately challenge my imagination saying, how would this be if it were perfect? Thus, I invite imagination to produce success. I hold this image of the perfect outcome for a moment in consciousness, declaring within myself, thus it shall be, thus or better than this. 
So imagination becomes now the servant of creative mind, constantly picturing the true and beautiful, even in the presence of the ugly actual. Seven, faith, power. To him who believes, all things are possible. So spoke the greatest teacher of all times, making belief or faith the very center of creative activity. I begin to realize that the importance of belief or faith can scarcely be overemphasized. I am beginning to realize that faith may be cultivated, that it is a feeling of reinforcement, that it is the operation of a law. And the law is this, that whatever ideas are emotionally accepted and believed immediately begin to be worked upon by the all-powerful level of subconsciousness. The more I contemplate this law, the more I know that my mind opens up into a universal and impersonal creativeness which will respond to my every accepted thought. Thus, more surely, will I build a deep and abiding faith. My faith is based upon the consciousness that universal mind has loaned out to me its subjective self and will bring to pass whatever I may project. 8. I start something. I realize that the source of much of my failure to produce abundance for myself in the past was my lack of daring to start something. I am now daily cultivating this consciousness of daring so that I may alertly move toward every objective which clearly presents itself. I begin to see why those who merely pray and then sit still and wait get no answer to their prayers. Answers come through the universal consciousness and one of its chief languages is action. I recognize that my movement toward my goal, my starting in ever so small a way toward my objective, sets in motion all the energies of the universe. Whatever my project, I will take time today to think out some definite action toward this goal. I am forming the habit of acting, not precipitately, but confidently, in the direction of every carefully thought out plan and purpose. 9. I act in expectancy of success. Mere action is often dogged and despairing. I shall act in hope. Many people impulsively move toward a goal before they have done their mental work upon it. Both these methods merely blockade the path. When I have desired, imagined, and believed that mind is responding to my thought, I then act expectantly toward the desired objective. Expectancy is the fruit of faith. It says, I give thanks and rejoice in advance, for I know that with all the power of mind reinforcing me, the outcome is sure. Thus, I move in release with spontaneous and hopeful certainty, and behind me and within flooding through in this action are all the supporting powers of the universal mind. I act in expectancy and hope. 10. Oneness with the universal power. I know that nature's modes are all conceived in abundance. With lavish hands, she pours out her treasure from a limitless fountain of rich inner energies. I mentally put myself in tune with Mother Nature's abundance, realizing that this is the mode of infinite mind. 
I too desire, think, feel, and act with a sense of abundance and power. Since I am a part of mind, the one creativeness and individualization of this one limitless creativeness, why should I not pour out from the limitless reservoirs of inner power, not only abundance for myself, but rich treasures for all those whom I know? I think of myself as a focal point for the limitless productiveness of the universe. Whatever I can think and believe, I can produce. This is the message of the universe to me. I believe it. I act upon it. It is done or is even now being done. Part 3 End of part two. Stay right here with me. Hit that like button. Subscribe to the channel. Leave me a comment. Let me know you were here. What is your best affirmation? All right. We're moving now to part three. Prosperity sidelights. Sidelight one. The game fish swims upstream. Perhaps you have been in the salmon fishery district when the run of salmon came in. It was a thrilling and exciting experience. Millions of salmon swimming madly toward their own spawning grounds, unreasoning, guided by an inner instinct, releasing energies such as they have never before possessed. Here they come rushing into inlets, up the mouths of rivers, and when there are dams in the way, leaping again and again until they tear the flesh from their sides. Some, indeed, die in the attempt to get over such cruelly baffling obstacles. Yet many of them leap clear over the obstructing dams and swim on upstream to their spawning grounds where the eggs are laid. Thus, in response to nature's call from within, counting life cheap, they discharge supernormal energies toward the attainment of this one supreme end. How marvelous it would be if man knew how to tap such tremendous reserves of subconscious energy. They are obviously here within him, for nature releases superpowers to all forms of organic life in moments of crucial need. Why must we forever operate ourselves consciously and voluntarily with guidance from these habitual levels which seem to say, I choose to do this, I consciously and mechanically release life's energies to this definitely desired end? Why can we not tap these superb reserves of limitless energy within us and fling them spontaneously into the attainment of our ambitions? If we could learn to do this, how different life would be. Man has superb sources of latent energy within him, and we often hear instances given of crucial moments in which he taps and uses them. Doubtless, you have heard stories of invalids who have not walked for years rising when the house took fire and carrying heavy articles down long stairways or of some little girl lifting the end of a heavy truck in order to release a small brother imprisoned beneath a wheel, or of mothers who endured unthinkable suffering, or moved through weeks of sleepless nursing in service of someone whom they loved. Such responses are not miracles, but law-governed activities. And if we knew just how to tap such energies, they might be available to us at all times. Dr. J. A. Hatfield in his Psychology of Power gives us many such instances and deduces from them the law under which such energies are available. This very helpful little book is now some 20 years old and perhaps is not down to the minute with relation to its chronology, but it clearly gives the mental side of the law 
under which man taps unused energies. Dr. Hadfield makes clear to us that our subjective energies are not alone physical in nature, but that they move forward into expression on many levels of consciousness in response to the instinctive subconscious man. Then, at the close of the book, he shows us that these tremendous unused powers are capable of being tapped voluntarily through the imagination and the instincts, and in the last few pages explains how the religious emotions release to man the greatest of energies under the conception of his own limitless cosmic power. Why have we not learned to touch these inner energies? Why do we not recognize that they are not due to functioning of the cortex brain, but are released by techniques of thinking which involve the subconscious power of man? This, and just how it is done, is to be one of the bits of scientific knowledge which the future is to give us. And even now, the training of ourselves along these lines is among the most valuable attainments of man. These powers are in the main emotional powers, responses to our enthusiasms, our ambitions, our beliefs that we can. But the drudgery of everyday life and the fear of failure moves down upon these unused sources of powers and overlays them with a coating of negative emotion and of unbelief in our own potentials, which results in staleness and in an unprofitable sense of frustration. We are so likely to get into the monotonous treadmill attitude and not to stop long enough to release these supreme and marvelous energies within us. There is no reason why we cannot, however. We should make our bid for them. We must, in fact, if we are to succeed in that big way which our imagination and our ambitions dictate. Now, mere enthusiasm sometimes boils over and wastes our energy, and yet true enthusiasm is one of the ways to tap this deep reservoir of power. We should be able to release our enthusiasms consciously, harness them to the drive of our central ambition, and if we could do this, we should have seemingly inexhaustible power to forward our accomplishment. True creativeness and permanent prosperity demand this kind of mental action. To develop these deeper powers, we should recognize for one thing, the importance of the psychology of desire and of how rightly handled desire can thrust forward our ideal into the focal point of consciousness and pour into it the substance of these supreme subconscious energies. If you say you desire a certain thing and keep your mind focalized upon it, you will in a few minutes feel energies beginning to surge up into your body. You will say to yourself, I know I am breaking through inhibitions, intensifying the energy that normally pours through my organism. Not only so, but my mind is more alert. I have new ideas, fresh inventiveness, and the courage to put across my central ambition. I should like to quote for you a little experiment which Dr. Hadfield carried on with a group of men who were in one of his rehabilitation hospitals in England after the Great War. These were shell-shocked patients, for whom he was endeavoring to restore that confidence which would fit them to triumphantly meet the problems of life. He says, I asked three groups of men to submit themselves to a test of the effect of mental suggestion on their strength which was measured by the gripping of a dynamometer. I tested them, first in their normal walking condition, second, after suggesting, under a mild hypnosis, that they were very weak, third, after suggesting under the same hypnosis that they were very strong. 
in each case, the men were told to grip the dynamometer as tightly as they could. That is to say, to exert the will to its utmost. Under hypnosis, the mind is very suggestible, and the response to the suggestion of weakness and strength gave very remarkable results. In the normal waking condition, the men gave an average grip of 101 pounds, with no attempt to stimulate either way, either up or down. When under hypnosis, I had given the men the idea that they were very weak, the average grip was only 20 pounds. What a change from 101 pounds to only 20 pounds, just because the man didn't think he could. I have seen men who were suffering from shock induced by the loss of a business or the loss of a large sum of money in just such a condition. They could not believe that they were ever again going to be able to put across a large business deal because they had bowed down before the hypnotic suggestion of their own sense of failure. They could no longer release their inner powers. But let me continue with Dr. Hadfield's story. When I had given these men the idea that they were very weak, the average grip was 20 pounds. One of them, a prize fighter, remarked that his arm felt tiny, just like a baby's. My suggestion of strength produced an average increase to 142, which was the best they could do under normal waking conditions under this positive suggestion. When I suggested weakness, the full flood of energy was checked and the men were capable of only one-third of their normal strength. Whereas, by suggestion of strength, their latent power was liberated and their normal strength increased to half as much again. If a man can increase or decrease his energies in such a remarkable way by his own beliefs about himself, how important it is for us to begin to understand this law. How we limit ourselves by suggesting through the greater part of a day that we are discouraged, that we lack capacity, or that business conditions are too much for us. Why not use the same method in a positive way and suggest something that would step up our powers? In this direction lies the way in which we may greatly increase our efficiency. But just how may we tap these unused energies? Well, in the first place, I have suggested that ardent and continuous desire is one of the most effective ways. But desire is futile unless we have a single definite aim at the focal point of this desire. Most of us do not know definitely enough either what our objective is or what the means should be to the attainment of this objective. This latter element is more important than most people realize. May I quote you a paragraph from Napoleon Hill's book, Think and Grow Rich? Examine the first hundred people you meet and ask them what they want most in life and 98 of them will not be able to tell you accurately. If you press them for an answer, they will say security or money. A few will say happiness. Some others will say fame and power, and others will say social recognition, easy in living, ability to sing, dance, or write. But none of them, perhaps, will be able to define these terms or give the slightest indication of the plan by which he hopes to attain these vaguely expressed wishes. Riches do not respond to mere wishing. They respond to a definite plan backed by an intense desire which, constantly persisted in, discharges energy into our work. This making definite our desire and is, of course, a great economy of energy because by bringing one's objective into the focal point of consciousness, it eliminates many non-essential ideas. It gets one to focalizing upon a single objective and in place of being distracted by a hundred different exciting forces which come up to steal our energy, 
we drive through to success on this one. Another necessary element in the technique of releasing these inner energies is to cease to be afraid of opposition. The game fish swims upstream. Surely it takes opposition to bring the best out of us. Don't be afraid of difficulties. Consider every obstacle a challenge. Say, of course I can swim upstream. The very challenge arouses something in me. Tell yourself, I love to conquer. I love to play the game. I love to win. Do you remember how backbones came into existence? Understand that if game fish had not swum upstream, backbones would never have been formed. The opposition of a strong seagoing current forced the fish to struggle toward his old spawning grounds, and this struggle changed a mere cartilaginous nodo cord into a spinal column. It is the drive of desire power against opposition which develops strength. The next thing that we need is constant definition of our purpose. Keep us up to concert pitch. Try and experiment with me. Resolve with me and within yourself that you are going to set down in a little book each morning what your objectives really are for this day. And with these, the long distance objectives which may take weeks or years to attain. Resolve with me also that you're going to stay behind these mentally for a few minutes daily until your desires arouse within you a feeling of their possibility. Speak the words aloud. I am moving toward these desired ends. I know that mind within me is capable of creating. I know that my desire releases subconscious creative energies. I know that the whole universe is behind every legitimate ambition. Nothing shall stop me. Believe me, such thinking works wonders. And if you will daily become conscious of a higher level of confidence and power, you will release energies adequate to put across your every deep desire. May I, in closing this talk, quote for you another paragraph from Napoleon Hill's book? Late in life, after having analyzed thousands of people, I discovered that most ideas are still born and need the breath of life injected into them by definite plans and immediate action. The time to use an idea is at the time of its birth. Every minute it lives gives it a better chance to survive. The fear of criticism is at the bottom of the destruction of most ideas which never reach the planning and action stage. Don't you feel that what Mr. Hill says is absolutely true? That many of your own finest ideas have been killed by somebody's criticism? Don't blame the person who criticizes. Blame yourself. If you were enthusiastic enough, if you understood this law of inner fire adequately, you would not have allowed this criticism to stop you. Don't let either the indifference of others or the daily routine and the rush and press of ordinary life come surging in upon you and cause this child of your imagination to die stillborn. Why don't you do something about it today? If you would even start toward it, you would find the barriers beginning to crumble and other new ideas would correlate with this central one and before you knew it, you would be putting the project across. Most businesses which fail go down because they are not daring enough to continually put across new ideas. Remember, the game fish swims upstream. Let's not allow a mere fish to shame us. Let's take a little more time daily to release the cosmic energy within us. Set your goal, then swim on upstream. 
End of side light one. Let's move on to the next video where we will now have part three, side light two. You can do anything.